You've been involved in uh, international groups looking at these issues for quite some time. What, what, what have you learned about prospects for cooperation and uh, work, working together across different cultures or different national interests? Um, an enormous amount. It's been, it's been absolutely fascinating. It's been part of the, the, the reason for doing these things. Um, you don't get paid to do these things, but I always get more out of them than I put in because of, of, of that sort of thing. Uh, on the adaptation side, um, there are sometimes unintended consequences. We looked at the ter- determinants of adaptive capacity, and we went through those. There were eight of them. Mm-hmm. Um, but one of them is access to resources, so it looked like um, increased investments in foreign aid to alleviate poverty and things like that was pretty good climate policy as well. Uh-huh. Um, so I wrote a couple of papers about that with some international co-authors and things like that. Unfortunately, in the negotiations, they took us at our word and said, all this money that we're giving out in aid counts as climate policy, oh, so we're as done. Cl- oh, <laughs> <laughs> I see. Which wasn't exactly yeah. what, we, what we had in mind. I see. Um, but the, and then they tried to create adaptation from funds under the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change. There isn't a lot of that happening just yet. Uh, it's administered through a, something called JEF, Global Environmental Fa- Facility. Um, and they're willing to underwrite the incremental cost of adaptation with respect to these particular problems Mm -hmm. uh, and other sorts of investments that people were making. Uh, Unfortunately, that's like throwing a 10-foot rope out to somebody who's 100 feet offshore drowning. I see. And so that really didn't work. So among the things that happened, the countries like Bangladesh has said, I'm tired of waiting for the, for the globe to, to act. We're going to do it ourselves. Yeah. And that's not a rich country, but they're right. devoting $100 million a year of their own money to investing in adaptation to climate change. And so this, we're, we've kind of made this transition from uh, to to the what we can do in in, in Bangladesh uh, case, uh, you know, as you say, tired of waiting, having to do something. The New York case as well. What are the uh, uh, and and there are all these engineers and technology people working on, I guess, technological um, uh, adaptations or perhaps even I don't know if the word cure is the right word, but. <clears throat> fixes to change, I guess, the dynamic of car- how carbon works in the atmosphere. Um, do you have a perspective on that in terms of kind of, uh, I guess, on that, on the risk uh, uh, consequences as a paradigm? I mean, they, these could make people hope for a big breakthrough. Um, short of that, um, what, what kind of investments do you see being reasonable in that area of of technological changes yeah. to uh, work, way carbon works? Oh, I don't know a lot of, about the technical details. I, mm-hmm. I do know as an economist that you have to price carbon. It can't be zero. Right. Um, and provide incentives for the reflection of the climate change damage benefits of investments in things like windmills and things like that. Um, I actually did um, a little bit of consulting for the people that were trying to build the Cape Cod wind farm. Mm -hmm. And they asked me to to calibrate the economic value of the carbon savings, Mm -hmm. uh, assuming that the windmills were going to replace coal-fired power plants. And it was in in present value, it was in the order of a billion, a billion and a half dollars. and that actually made a difference in the in the decision going yeah. forward. So that so that sort of thing certainly works. The, the the other observation I think is that there is no magic silver bullet. Mm-hmm. You need a little bit of this and a little bit of that and a little bit of something else. Um, and the technological advances will probably happen in the private sector, but there's an enormous need for pure scientific research to underwrite that. Yeah. So the Department of Energy and NSF. Have, have sort of signed off on that. Um, government picking winners doesn't seem to work very well. Yeah. Solera, the 
is that the name? Yeah, so, yeah the, the, <laughs> whatever it was called, uh, is, is a classic example of, of something that's, that's not so good. Um, but maybe, again, doing, you think about risk, and now we're talking about the risk of an investment working or not working, um, underwriting a little bit of the insurance for the initial development of something that's commercially feasible, mm -hmm. and then the economic investment of making something that's economically feasible uh, capable of penetrating markets, because mm -hmm. that's the second step. You could have a wonderful idea, and if nobody picks it up, right. so what? So, so there, there, there's something called the valley of death in technological development, and it's between having a really good idea, showing that it's economically feasible, mm -hmm. and then actually getting it to the market. Right. What, what kinds of things are your students interested in uh, the working in this area? Uh, You're at Wesleyan. <laughs> yeah, I'm at Wesleyan. Um, one of the things I worry about is spending so much time doing this other stuff that I'm distracted from them. So I, th I feel an obligation to actually bring some of this stuff back. Um, so a couple of the exercises I've done in the sustainability class and also the upper level environmental economics class um, are things like negotiation exercises. Oh. Um, in the IPCC, um, the summaries for policymakers are submitted to the governments. You spend five days in some hotel, mm -hmm. someplace, and they have to approve those things word for word unanimously. One country mm -hmm. can block something. Mm -hmm. um, so um, <clears throat> I have access to preliminary um, language. Mm -hmm. I assign each student a country. Yeah. The rabid environmentalists <laughs> I make represent China. Uh -huh. <laughs> um, the, the people who are um, sort of economists and believe in free markets and things like that, I make them represent Germany. Mm -hmm. um, and and they have to uh, investigate the, the stance of the country and then participate in the negotiation word for word mm. to change these two or three paragraphs. And that's always been fun. Yeah. They, 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 and did they, they get, get somewhere? Uh, the last time I did it, um, the uh, adjustments that they made in two paragraphs looked an awful lot like what actually came out. I see. So our students in, in this Coursera class are, as I said before, really scattered all over the globe. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, you know, if, if, if there are th what are some of the things they might think about doing in order to um, inform themselves or have a positive impact on, on uh, the trajectory of climate change and our adaptation to it? Well, I think the first thing they have to do um, is begin to understand the, the dimension of how the future might unfold and the various, various alternative scenarios of how the future might unfold. Then think about what, what that would mean for their particular country under different assumptions about how the global economy right. um, evolves over, over time. Um, they should also spend a little bit of time thinking about the specific manifestations of climate change and changes in extreme events and sea level rise and coastal storms and things right. like that um, that their countries might experience and begin to explore uh, who's thinking about what in terms of, of responding. For, for students from the developing world, um, Thinking about mitigation is probably 20 or 30 years too soon, but they're going to have to do that. Right. So there the question is, how can we jump technologies so we don't go through the entire cycle right. of high emissions and then trying to right. come back down? Is there a way of right. jumping, the, jumping the shark or whatever? Um, for adaptation, they could start in their home communities. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Using, using less... Uh, uh, non-renewable energies and and yeah and but with with respect to global policy, this is probably controversial. I'd be interested. I know you're going to speak with Jeffrey Sachs. I'd be interested in his his thought about this. But it seems like the framework convention in negotiating a global agreement on emissions reductions uh, for all of the countries in the world, which the United States requires, according to the Bert Hegel. Um, agreement f just after Kyoto um, is probably never going to be productive. Mm -hmm. What will be productive are bi bilateral negotiations and agreements 
like what just happened between China and the United States, right. that will set the tone and show other countries how to move forward uh, with the new technology, do the technological development, um, and then distribute it. Yeah. So people can can take action in their local communities that will make a difference and, and also um, uh, join with others to uh, uh, move their governments to creating uh, perhaps not global uh, unanimity, but bilateral agreements uh, that could have a significant impact um, both on our capacity to adapt and, and perhaps reducing our poisoning of the, of the um, atmosphere. Um, what, what, uh, how do we, uh, what's the best tools for assessing this? What, what, what are, what, what's the, what, what's the current state of, of, uh, climate assessment? The fifth assessment report of IPCC is coming out. The science is already out. The, um, impacts and adaptation of vulnerability will come out in March. Mm -hmm. Um, there's been assessments in the United States by the National Academy of Sciences. There's the National Climate Assessment that's undergoing right now. Um, the acceptance of a risk-based approach and the focus, as you noted, on the likelihood, the probabilities, has caused us to become much more careful in the degree of confidence that we express on what we've detected mm -hmm. and what, we've, what we can attribute. Mm -hmm. um, there's still plenty out there, but um, we will get beat up in March because our detection and attribution chapter is not as strong as it was in the fourth assessment report. But I think we've been much more careful. Mm -hmm. The fourth assessment report claimed 29,000 studies. Well, in fact, uh, there were only about 110, and some of them uh, had a thousand different trees in the same place. Each one was a study. Mm -hmm. I'm not so sure that statistically that that holds up as, as, as something significant. So people are beginning to become very, very careful, not cautious, but careful. Mm -hmm. And then the question is, well, why did you include these things? Because the consequences are so high. Right. And then you articulate the consequences, and then you articulate how people might be able to respond. Um, the other thing that assessments are trying very hard to recognize is that there actually are some benefits to climate change. Mm -hmm. um, uh, some of the agricultural yield models suggest that modest warming, as long as you have water around, mm -hmm. uh, will increase yields. And ice-free Arctic um, uh, has enormous economic consequences for transportation, mm -hmm. for the development of coastal ports, and things like that. So a question might be, why would countries like Canada and Russia Hmm. Um, invest in mitigating emissions of greenhouse gases because they're getting all of these benefits. And unfortunately, the answer is we're already committed to the warming that will guarantee an ice-free Arctic. Mm -hmm. Further warming is going to cause damage elsewhere in their economies. Yeah. So reducing their emissions isn't going to damage their benefits, but will ameliorate the, the, the damages that they will see in the future. So I think the the, the lesson that I'm, I'm, I'm gleaning from our conversation is that um, these broad declarations uh, of uh, absolute certainty or dogma um, got a lot of attention and, 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 and because we were so worried about um, the enormous risks. But um, as we have refined the science and refined the uh, sense of consequences of these changes, um, we we are um, dealing more in probabilities and in a more um, detailed uh, analysis of um, how uh, of differential vulnerability of benefits of 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 extreme uh, costs. It's still a frightening environment, but it's not frightening in the same way for all people in all places. Um, and in some ways, the stakes are higher because we have a more nuanced picture. Right. Um, it, right. So, so back in the day when, when people were making strong statements about this or that, uh, that could easily be misinterpreted. Yeah. Um, they, be, they were slow-moving targets yeah. for the skeptics. Um, an answer to the question, what should students around the world think about that I didn't get to is the series of questions that the skeptics pose mm -hmm. and how to answer them right. um, quickly. Um, 
But moving back to the new risk-based approach, um, it's much more honest, it's much more scientifically justified, it is much more difficult to communicate, right? You can't do it in 15 words, you have to do it in 50 words. Right. And by the time you get to word 25, everybody's going, oh, what are you talking about? <laughs> yeah. um, and you're also asking now people to, in, for mitigation, invest in reducing the likelihood, right? And you can't measure that, right? It, you're not buying guarantees that these right. things aren't going to happen. You're just reducing the likelihood. And, you know, frankly, it's, it's not going to be free. It's not right. going to be as expensive as some people say, but it's not, it's not going to be free. So is there an example of huge amounts of public money being invested in reducing the likelihood of a bad thing happening? And I would suggest Homeland Security as well. I was well. going to say, there's a, there's, there's a lot of examples. And, <clears throat> and it's, a, <clears throat> excuse me, it's a model that we understand because um, uh, when the likelihood uh, is of an event that has catastrophic uh, uh, potential, we're willing to, um, to invest heavily in, in reducing uh, that likelihood. Right. Even Dick Cheney agrees with that. He had the 99% rule, right? Yeah. If there's a 1% yep. chance of a really bad thing happening, we should do everything we can to eliminate that 1%. Well, Gary O, thank you so much for making time to talk with me this morning. And uh, uh, I think all of us now understand a little bit better um, both uh, the, the, the risks uh, of these changes and also some of the things we can do to adapt uh, to those risks. So thank you so much. I appreciate it. Good to talk with you.